How you doing? I'm Chris. This is Suez Crisis Part 2 of 2. Why are you listening to me? Let's get into the video. In July 1956, Egyptian President Gamal Abdel Nasser announced the nationalization of the Suez Canal Company. Egyptians would take charge of this vital strategic waterway, connecting Europe to Asia with immediate effect. Makes Britain sense. and France relied on the canal route for their vital supplies of Middle East oil, which fueled their economies. In their eyes, Nasser was a threat. A dictator intent on uniting the Arab world against them, destroying their influence in the Middle East and North Africa, and using control of the canal as a weapon against them. Secretly, Britain and France agreed to force regime change on Egypt. A joint military intervention to depose Nasser and reassert their standing as global powers. not Britain or France that struck first against Nasser. It was Israel. On the 29th of October, Israeli paratroopers landed in the Egyptian Sinai, seizing the strategic Mitla Pass and paving the way for an invasion by ground forces. At the UN, Israel insisted it was acting in self-defense against raids by Palestinian fighters known as Fedayeen, operating from bases in Gaza and Sinai. Fedayeen determined to wipe out the bases in the Sinai wilderness from which murder and death and destruction are launched again. But there were no Fedayeen bases in Sinai. Britain and France, claiming to be acting on behalf of the international community, issued an ultimatum to both sides. Stop fighting within 12 hours and withdraw all forces 10 miles from the Suez Canal, or they would intervene to enforce compliance. Okay, that's right, I remember Egypt this. Egypt was effectively being told to abandon the Sinai and the canal. Israel accepted the terms, Nasser refused. I remember this. Okay. Yep. So on the 31st of October, British and they 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 gave that ultimatum knowing Israel I believe Israel was yeah, Israel was in on it uh, obviously. Israel started it. They were the, you know, the reason the whole war starts. And then the ultimatum is given and Israel kind of is like, "Okay, whoa, 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 we're sorry." And they back out of there. And Nasser doesn't hear that. He just hears, I'm not abandoning the Suez Canal. What are you talking about? This is mine. And they were like, oh, your forces are there. We're, we're invading. I remember this part. If I've got it wrong, then let me know. My internet is not good. French aircraft taking off from carriers in the Mediterranean and bases in Cyprus and Malta began bombing Egyptian airfields, air defences and infrastructure. But not all was as it seemed. Israeli Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion had been considering an attack on Egypt for many months. He was encouraged by Moshe Dayan, the hawkish commander of Israel's armed forces. Nasser, like all leaders of Arab states, did not view the new Jewish state as legitimate. Now receiving modern weapons from Czechoslovakia, he was seen as a potential threat to Israel's survival. They were also determined to end Egypt's blockade of the Straits of Tehran, which prevented Israeli access to the Red Sea and limited opportunities for trade. 
France wanted to ally with the Israelis to get rid of Nasser. But British Prime Minister Sir Anthony Eden was anxious about being seen as the aggressor. So the French came up with an idea. At Sèvres, near Paris, representatives of Britain, France and Israel met in secret to plan a war. Israel would invade Egypt, allowing Britain and France, posing as peacemakers, to issue an ultimatum they knew only Israel would accept. Then, claiming yeah. to be acting to safeguard the canal, they would invade Egypt and overthrow Nasser. Though they had no real plan for what to do once he was gone. It would take oh, years wow. for the full details of this conspiracy to emerge. So they didn't have a plan for him? Like afterwards? I mean, I hate to say this, but that's stupid planning to not have a plan. <laughs> I don't know what just happened there, but okay, good, good job on me. Hold on. On the 5th of November, after a week of bombing, and with Israeli troops winning the battle in Sinai, British and French paratroopers were dropped onto targets around Port Said and Port Fuad at the mouth of the Suez Canal. Once on the ground, they quickly seized Egyptian airfields and key infrastructure. The next morning, under cover of airstrikes and naval bombardment, British and French landings began. Fierce street fighting raged throughout the day, but the Egyptians were massively outgunned and it proved a one-sided contest. Around 600 Egyptian soldiers and police were killed. British and French deaths totaled just 26. Egyptian civilians suffered most, up to 1,000 lost their lives, with many more left homeless by air raids and shelling. By the end of the day, the British and French were in control. But they couldn't prevent the Egyptians sabotaging the Suez Canal itself. They sank ships in its narrow channel, blocking the canal and putting it out of action for several months. And all that did was hurt everyone else. And I mean, props to Egypt for that, you know, they, they made, it, hey England, there you go. You want it, now you gotta fix it. And then if you're Egypt, you just wait and then England fixes it and you, you take it back. <laughs> It wasn't hard to see that the British, French and Israelis were working together. Yeah. And at the United Nations, world opinion quickly turned against them. For once, the US and Soviet Union were united in condemnation. <laughs> A typically animated Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev even threatened to fire rockets at Paris and London. Oh, wow. President Eisenhower thought the invasion had no moral or legal justification, and he was furious with his British ally for going behind his back. Yep, the British I remember that. and French governments delivered a 12-hour ultimatum to Israel and Egypt, now followed up by armed attack against Egypt. The United States was not consulted in any way about any phase of these actions, nor were we informed of them in advance. As it is the manifest right of any of these nations to take such decisions and actions, it is likewise our right, if our judgment so dictate, for we do not accept the use of force as a wise or a proper instrument for the settlement of international disputes. 
Eisenhower wanted international attention focused on Hungary, where Soviet troops were, at that moment, brutally crushing a popular uprising. Instead, Britain and France's reckless intervention was likely to push Arab states closer to the Soviet Union. Because in some weird way, Britain and France are more closely, at the, I, I would say at this time, are more closely associated with the US than with Russia or Soviet Union. So, I mean, when Eisenhower says we weren't informed, we weren't anything, how many countries do you think were like, bullshit, you were totally in on it, you just weren't there, you know, kind of sucks. In the UN Security Council, Britain and France used their veto to block resolutions that criticised Israel's attack on Egypt, or their own intervention. But with both world superpowers condemning their attack, they now faced a vote in the General Assembly, and the threat of UN sanctions. Britain's I'm going to go back and just look at this one guy for just a second. This guy from Pakistan. He just looks like we're going to get blamed for this shit somehow. I can just tell. <laughs> he just looks so worried. Threat of UN <laughs> sanctions. Britain's economy had been fragile before the crisis began. Now, market fears caused the British currency to crash, threatening economic disaster. Only a massive loan from the International Monetary Fund could save Britain. But Eisenhower blocked any IMF aid. Yeah, and I was going to say, Eisenhower, they contacted him, uh, from what I remember. They contacted him, and they were like, look, you got to help us. You know, we need some money. And he was like, no, nope. You did this on your own, so you're going to suffer the consequences. Till Britain agreed to a UN-backed ceasefire in Egypt. Yeah. If you want to eat healthy and feel your best, I do. You gotta try kachava. What is it? Kachava Tell me. Kachava is the world's healthiest all-in-one. Oh my god! Oh, it's sorry. Eden facing growing opposition abroad, at home, and from within his own government. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. A few options. Just two days after British troops landed in Egypt, I burped. they announced Sorry. a ceasefire. The French, abandoned by their ally, had no choice but to follow suit. Within days, the UN's first major peacekeeping operation got underway, as Danish UN troops arrived in Egypt to take over from the British and French. to take over for, so British and French cleared out and then they probably moved in I'm, I'm gonna guess it's the Danish what are they gonna do they're too nice had some weapons though Jesus as they packed up and re-embarked on their landing ships to return home it was officially job well done but in truth, Suez had been a humiliating fiasco. What do you, the what political else leadership had been reckless. What are you supposed to say? It was a, as they're saying, it was a humiliating defeat. They're not going to tell their troops that. They don't want, you know, I mean, you can't say that to the troops. The troops are just doing what they're told. You could say that to the country leaders, yes. Humiliating defeat. Why would you put your soldiers in harm's way like that? Sure, that different, but you can't say that to the soldiers because the soldiers are only doing what they're told, and they don't want to be told, "Hey, that, you just went through a humiliating defeat." We did. The military objectives confused, and as soon as international pressure had mounted up the British had had no option but to abort the entire mission. That winter, under intense American pressure, 
Israeli forces also withdrew from Sinai. The Suez Crisis forced Britain and France to accept that they were now second-rank powers. No longer could they act as they wished on the world stage, without first considering the view of the United States. The lesson taken by the British was never again to jeopardise their so-called special relationship with America. Oh. For France... So, a uh, stupid question. When did England... Okay, so 1956 is when England kind of realized they were an empire in decline. So my question would be, when do you think... Do you think that's when it... 56? Do you think that's when it was in decline? I mean, it, it's, it's, it was in decline before then, sure. But when do you think they hit a point where... Because um, I would figure World War II... America topped England, or you know, um, but England was fucking. Uh, they were the backbone of of the of Europe at that time. So I, you know, I take that back. I don't think they were. And they were taking a beating. They kept getting knocked down and kept getting up. So I get, okay, 56, yeah, okay, 56 is fair. 56 is fair, I, I, okay, I can see that. The lesson was that Britain and America were unreliable allies, and their interests were better served by closer ties within Europe. Israel achieved some objectives, including the opening of the Straits of Tehran to Israeli shipping. But with Nasser still in power, future conflict with Egypt and its other Arab neighbours was almost certain. The Sinai War proved to be a precursor to the far more decisive Six-Day War, fought a decade later. That was against Israel. Wasn't the Six-Day War basically a shit ton of countries against Israel? And Israel beat all of them? I'm correct. British Prime Minister Sir Anthony Eden's career and health were ruined. He resigned, but not before lying to Parliament about his knowledge of the secret deal with Israel. Oh. I wish my successor all the fortune. And God speed to you all. Goodbye. Thank you very much. President Nasser, fated as the hero of the Arab world for having stood up to European imperialists, had in reality been saved by US and UN intervention. But his But I understand why everyone looks at him getting saved by uh, by US and UN. Okay, yeah. But I I mean he did stand up so it makes him look good. I mean, eh, U.S., U.N., I would even throw Russia in there, there's, sorry, Soviet Union. They may not have done anything, but their voice, um, you know, going against what happened to Egypt, I would say, was would have been, at that time, would have been just as strong as the U.S. voice. So I would say that when you have, you know, the two world powers at the time basically saying that you've done nothing wrong, yeah. You kind of feel like, yeah, no, of course I didn't. And he didn't. I mean, it was a, whether you could say him nationalizing that and, and it was all legal and everything like that, yeah. It was a shitty thing that happened, sure. But he had every right to do it. And can you imagine if there was some kind of a canal in England or in France and Egypt was building it and those countries decided they were going to nationalize it? Egypt would be mad at them. It'd be no different. So, is you know, modernizing just reforms, flip it. championing of the Arab cause, and opposition to foreign intervention 
mean his memory is still revered by Arabs across the Middle East. Uh, how did he die? He wasn't killed, like, like assassinated or anything, was he? It's just a random death? Because that's fucking young, man. Huh. The impact of the Suez Crisis on America was perhaps the most far-reaching. The collapse of British and French prestige amongst Arab nations meant the US would now take the lead in countering Soviet expansion in the Middle East and securing the West's oil supplies. The Suez Crisis would accelerate US involvement in this volatile region. The consequences would stretch well into the 21st century. Clarifying debate over a possible war in Iraq has given an added sense of urgency to their mission. Huh. So the Suez Crisis kind of escalated America's push to secure oil in the Middle East. Interesting. I never linked one to the other, but it makes sense um, for fear that <laughs> it could be taken away from you. This is really good. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I had some fluid go down the wrong tube. <coughs> that or death to one of them. I know a few of you are kind of like, oh, I hope so. But I'll make a video tomorrow. <coughs> and I'll tell you I'm still alive. And then you guys will be so mad. Damn bug. I gotta feed my dogs. You wanna eat? And that's a yes. Jungle potty and then eat. Let's so yes. I'm going to I'm talking, bitch. I said I'm talking. <clears throat> that wasn't me. That was the dogs. So I'm going to go ahead and end this video here. Uh thanks for what? Whoa. Let's try that again. I'm going to go ahead and end this here. Um thanks for watching. Have a good day. Have a good night.